Thank you. Thank you. And that means if you would like to not have your face showing during the recording, you can turn off your video so, mm -hmm. so that you know you can do that. And welcome. Oh, now I feel like it's live. It's Saturday night. No, <laughs> Thursday night <laughs> at Alameda Island Poets. Uh, we are so happy that you all showed up and we know that you are going to love what you're going to hear tonight. And then you're going to get a chance to write some and read some. So I am going to turn it over to Kim McMillan. And now I'm going to spotlight you. Okay. Hi, Here, Kim McMillan. Hi, I, I'm Kim McMillan. I, I think this lighting is okay. Um, oh, wait I a minute, want... Kim. Hold on. I should mute everybody. Hold on. I'm going to mute. Oh, okay. okay. You're going to have to unmute yourself. So hold on. Let me mute, mute everybody. Okay. Unmute yourself and then you're good to go. Hi, I'm Kim McMillan and I want to say I'm thrilled to be here. This is one of my favorite uh, reading series because the way it's done, there is so much kindness and there is so much heart in this, the Alameda Island series. And so I'm very thankful to be at this poetry series. Um, I wanna welcome our audience and I want to also just give thanks for the, the, the wonderful energy, the healing energy through poetry that's in the air. And I also want to say that uh, Ishmael Reed has been working for a couple of months, the, the poet and activist and writer Ishmael Reed, to get an article about Black Fire this time inside the, um, the New York Review of Books. I, I'm the editor of the book and the panelists or the poets today are actually all inside this book that was published by Willow, um, Willow Books um, by the publisher Heather Buchanan. And the article is coming out Saturday in the New York Review of Books. And so I'll put it up and please have a look at it because what it does is it traces the black arts movement to show that it's really the black uh, diaspora around the world and how artists around the world really had a part in the creation of the black arts movement. It was not just one place like the United States. It's, it's wherever there were black bodies um, during um, the 60s and 70s and possibly some of the 80s. So we're really looking forward to um, the, the review. And so we're gonna start the program with the absolutely wonderful Seeley McInnes. Uh, I want to tell you something of, about Seeley, and I just, hold on just a, a second, please. Um, Seeley is what I consider a major figure in the sense that because of Seeley, I know what's happening around the country with regard to um, Black literature. Uh, Celie McGinnis is a poet, short story writer, Prince scholar. Get that, he's a scholar on Prince and, his, he's, and it's just incredible the work he's done. He's a retired instructor of English at Jackson State University, former editor, publisher of Black Magnolia's Literary Journal and author of eight books, including four collections of poetry, one collection of short stories, scripts, sketches and tales of urban Mississippi. One work of literary criticism, The Lyrics of Prince, A Literary Look. One co-authored work, Brother Hollis, The Sankofa of a Movement Man, which discusses the life of legendary Mississippi civil rights icon and former first runner up of the Amiri Baraka Sonia Sanchez Poetry Award. Additionally, he has been published in magazines, newspapers, and anthologies. Seely is amazing. And so please, please give a warm welcome to Celie McInnes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. You can't you can't just be matter. Mm-hmm. You got to be energy. Mm-hmm. I say I say you can't just be matter. Mm-hmm. You got you got to be energy. Mm-hmm. And it ain't no sense being no spook mm-hmm. if you ain't willing to be spooky. Mm-hmm. And, and it ain't no sense of being spooky mm-hmm. if you ain't willing to scare the evil out of some folk. Mm-hmm. So I guess I'll be an electric spook. Mm-hmm. Or maybe I'll just be spooky electric. Is that all right? Mm-hmm. But the real question is, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I say the real question is, mm-hmm. are you fertilizer mm-hmm. or are you excrement? Mm-hmm. I say, are you fertilizer or are you excrement? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Can a poem be as effective as a 357 can the images of a poem spray buckshot holes into the body of a green back stuff she wearing shop can a poem be thrown as a brick through the window of a grocery store so we may pillage and plunder its shelves for food for the hungry can a poem be laid on top of 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 a poem until we have built a shelter for the homeless? Does a poem need a million dollar war chest or a foundation grant to be mightier than a sword? What good does a poem do a spoiled, bloated belly? Can a poem lay hands on the sick and clothe the naked? Can a poem work hoodoo on an ACT score? Can a poem pull the rent payment from a magician's hat? Can poems assassinate Negro turncoats who have sold their souls to racist rags? Can poems cut short the lives of serpentine superintendents who slide suffocate African babies in neural excrement disguised as Caucasian curriculums. Poets are the African bees of political pollination and poems are the sperms of revolution. We need poets to stop adding extra syrup and saccharin to their sonnets so to appease the pale palace of people who have not the stomach for straight no chase of truth. We need poets to stop mindlessly masturbating away their talents into the mental napkins of oversexed audiences. We need poets to start impregnating thoughts of black magnolias bursting through white cement into the minds of rave and virgin souls who have out it tall into the reproductive process of self-aversion. Poems are the sperms of revolution. Are you making love to your people or simply fornicating away your existence? Thank you. So that first poem is in this wonderful anthology by Dr. McMillan, uh, Black Tribe This Time. Uh, I want us to also say that I am a second generation Jackson State University graduate. For those of you who don't know, Jackson State is an HBCU, a historically black university. My mother was a Jackson State graduate. My father was a Jackson State graduate. Two uncles Jackson State graduates, two aunts Jackson State graduates. Three of my siblings were Jackson State graduates. Moreover, our family doctor was a Jackson State graduate. Our family lawyer was a black college graduate. And our family dentist was a black college graduate. As such, it's been very frustrating for me to have my alma mater dragged nationally by lies and rumors over the past two months. But even more disappointing is to have other Black people not only be so willing to believe those lies about my alma mater, but be ready and willing to perpetuate those lies because unfortunately, Black people tend to be the first people to devalue Black institutions. Along with those lies and rumors, other Black folk have sought to tell me, well, see, well, you need to understand that HBCUs are insignificant because 2.1 million Black folks attend white colleges while only 200,000 Black folks attend HBCUs. But here's the problem with that statistic. While only 200,000 Black folks attend HBCUs, HBCUs still produce 80% of all Black judges, 50% of all Black lawyers, and 50% of all Black doctors. And additionally, Jackson State University produces more Black PhDs than any school on the planet, including any white school that you can name. So these next two poems are dedicated to refuting the lies about my alma mater and HBCUs in general. The first one is titled The Tree of Life, Black Colleges Be Here. Black colleges are the water, fertilizing, scorched earth, remaining the only well from which we can freely drink of ourselves. They be the consistency of summer, always following the spring, removing the frigid film of freezer burn from the fresh eyes of chocolate children. Soul colleges be the sunshine of stewardship, producing battle-tested butterflies, breaking through concrete cocoons with golden new dawn, slicing through the tight twilight of subjugation. 
No matter your dusty deeds or witchcraft words, R and B academies be the precise clock that never stops through budget cuts, program cuts, people cuts, and cuts yet to see how sharp their supremacy can be. But with all of the chalk hang, the chainsaw cutting of the lumberjacks of the legislator, our legacy remains a mighty magnolia tree towering high above the cantankerous canard about obsidian wisdom. Militia congressmen run highways through our campus like it's Grand Central Station. City mayors sit blinded by greenbacks from pale palms as our deserted decor dilapidates with the frosted flight of fling industry. Yet when the heavily armed swastika of Mississippi marched in a merciless maid, the future of Comet seems like misguided pesticides desperately trying to trample the fluorescent flowers of hope. With the thunderstorm of steel rain that poured from the funnel cloud of Governor Paul B. Johnson, chalky hearted through the lightning rod to state issue machine guns and redneck rifles, 700 rounds were fired into the soul of the urban think tank of muddy waters. 700 steel arrows pelted, screaming babies hanging like rag dolls from broken windows, leaving the crimson floor of the middle passage. When the raging storm was finished, leaving brick buildings shredded like Swiss cheese and the stain of death was clean from the mosaic spiritual life and tears dried by the silk washcloth of Southern soul babies. We stood on the steps of 1400 J.R. Lynn Street and proclaimed, you missed mother governor, you missed, cause still we be here, here we be still. So vomit any vehement you feel, we will still be planted here in this place, in this moment of time, becoming the rock upon which we build the Bastilla of Black Pipe Brain Power, steady that half ass affirmative action plans at antebellum schools that ain't never affirmed by Colonel Reb or Major Millsap. We still be the birds and bees impregnating ebony minds with red, black, and green knowledge. We be the spawning soil of ghetto prodigies to plant their visions of sovereignty. We be the rain that washes away the dead soil of Jim Crow and revitalizes the sea of onyx autonomy. We be the oxygen that flows through the lungs of raven lambs. We be the rod and the staff of indigo Israelites trapped in Pharaoh's pandemonium of whiteness. We be the shepherds of the flock, leading them to green pastures of self-determination. See, we might be limping like wounded liberation soldiers, but our history gives us endless ammunition. We may be misdirected pilots flying backwards, but our compass is still facing the North Star freedom. We might be staggering punch drunk fighters, but like, like Ali's Apex, we shall rise in the last round and strike a mighty death blow to ignorance, thus defying the good old boy back settlement of the heirs' case where black representatives in white face pretzelize themselves into compromising positions so that Governor Muskrat can stand tall on the legacy of Barnett, damning the funds flowing into HBCU rivers. Attempting to keep our institutions as breeding grounds for sharecropper labor with black hands and stains burning and straining from the whip of the wheel of history. We pull with every fiber of our weary bodies to combine like cornbread and greens, the curriculums of Washington and Du Bois in a way that illuminates emancipation that is not planted in the wavering fickle soil of slick, slippery liberalism, but planted in the garvey rich soil of one people, one aim, one destiny to flower to freedom. See, we must throw BAs in cast iron survival. We must throw MAs in soothing self-love. We must throw MBAs in collectively quilted work. We must throw PhDs in ferocious freedom fighting. So through the plans of congressmen continue to spit sour speech about the spoils of our legacy, we remain a highway to hallelujah for children desperately trying to escape the plantation of poorly plighted schools that rape their souls and lynch their dreams. We be the washboards for saplings whose minds have been mired in the most of Chopley curriculum. We'd be the Underground Railroad of offsprings whose parents found freedom on the tracks of our train. So rifle what you will with your wayward words. Our actions will continue to churn your spoiled milk into fresh cream fortified with dark chocolate crystals. Black bakeries of brilliance be here because butterscotch minds need chefs who understand how to cultivate them toward the sun, continuing to produce caramel culinary that is a healing fruit so that our community can germinate along side is ashy counterpart and not be strangled by the wings of poor funding and not be eaten by the insects of unfair mission standards and not be melted under the heat of improperly used test scores. So colorful colleges remain as a greenhouse to a bouquet of jubilee that nurtures the tree of life for all of the atoms and all of the eaves. And as long as the mocha masses be in need, we remain a fertile ground for a harvest of liberty. Thank you. This last poem is dedicated to my father, his brother, 
and his cousin, three men who spent over 50 years attending Jackson State football games using athletics as part of their liberation work. The title of it is Section 121, Row 18, Seats 9, 10, and 11, because those were the three seats in which they sat for 50 years. Eddie's G-Men weren't half-stepping that day when 20,000 Nubian tigers striped of distinct twin tribes banded into one nation under a stainless steel swag banner with the seventh U.S. Secretary of Education readying his beleaguered blue bingles for a battle with history and hate. Two commanders of collegiate confrontation commissioned to slay Confederate confines that damned humanity's river from flowing to its organic ocean of possibility. Yet on this awesome autumn in the year when Ben Brown became a blood brother, baptized in the crimson of the movement, when 400 wise wolves stormed Cheney's bastion and to secure the proper watering of Onyx original crops, when Seattle's purple haze got us all experienced enough to be bold as love and a brown lawyer became a superlative justice, the sonic underdog struck a booming blow for equality, upsetting Black America's greatest grid iron gladiator while they collectively collapsed the cowardly walls of white wretchedness. Yet more than a movement of marvel, our soul regularly fertilizes seeds that spring the fruit of four mighty titans enshrined in Canton. The handcuffs of Detroit with the speed of stallions, super bad Slater, the LA sledgehammer, Dr. Doom enveloping enemies into the dark side and sweetness performing miracles of movement, the four foundations who anchored three national parades, 17 swag sorays, and held the 80s hostage under the command of General Gordon, whose coaching tree continues to foster our forever flowering field of dreams. And your eyes have recorded every moment through the heavy heat of Jim Crow, through the Siberian winters of segregation, through the tornadoes and thunderstorms of the college board, withstanding the larcenous legislative mergers as survival is the basic building block in our Mississippi DNA. You and your cabal cousins remain seated like the perpetual spook planted by the door that would not be swept away by the raging currents of chalky conspiracies, bending but never breaking, bound by brotherhood. But when the governor, John Bell, rang a chorus of automatic weapons to eradicate black brain power, the trinity of you sat and stared into the fangs of snow serpents and never batted an eye for y'all remain focused on the prize that the devil's concubines couldn't contain. Your bliss buoyed by the breathtaking boom of baby tigers bouncing full body from the padded ghost post into the bosoms of 60,000 black folks barricading and blanking them in the blue storage a while being soothed by soulful sounds sweetly serenading the stands swaying to the thrill of a billion eyes whose constellations are more brilliant than the face that launched a thousand ships. And you remain rooted in your seat present for the roll call of revelry and revolution until the cubs were ready to manage the mantle. And in your final days, we tabernacle together, knowing that you will forever be with us for love is the indestructible goal that sustains the triumphant power of thee we love because belief is sowing based on unseen future benefits reaped by those bold enough to become battalions for a party harvest unhidden to the doers of the word weaved into being better builders of a bountiful but still bathed in navy that forever flows as a wave of strength and serenity watering our magnolia of freedom forever reaching for the place of the imperishable prize thank you for having me thank wow. you that was amazing yeah it, it was amazing thank you very much Celie. Um, our next poet is Linda Addison. Uh, I've, I am just thrilled. I, I, my heart is so open having all three of you here. And Linda, I, I really love her work. I love the fact that Linda, I don't think she talks about it as much, but she was one of, she was the first African-American to win the um, Grant, um, um, Bram Stoker Horror Award. Am I correct about that, Linda? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's yes. just, <laughs> that is such a big deal. And she's an award-winning author of five collections, including, I love this title, How to Recognize a Demon Has Become Your Friend. Uh, she's a re recipient of the HWA 
Lifetime Achievement Award, the HWA Mentor of the Year, and the um, SP, the SFPA Grandmaster of Fantastic Poetry. She's been published, she has published over 400 poems, stories, and articles. Uh, she is just a master at her work, as is everyone at this panel. I, I feel very lucky uh, to have these three wonderful people gathered. And so I'd like you all to give a very warm welcome to Linda Addison. Hello. Oh, Celie, taking us to church, baby. Woo! I got one thing to say, Celie. <laughs> and a poem be the soul for the soulless. Come on now. Woo! Stop it. Okay. Woo! I'm going to have to, like, you know, have a moment before I can get to me after that body out of soul displacement moment. Um, anyway, I have five poems to read for you. I'm going to read the, the first two are from Black Fire this time. And I'm going to hold this one up from 1968, Black Fire. That's, you know, we are now this time, but this was back then. An anthology of Afro-American writing. Remember that. Okay, here we go. So the first poem from uh, Black Fire this time is called Meta Gender Machine. Like a splendor in my mind driving me mad, these thoughts, feelings, shifting my desire like a fractal in my soul. I split, revise, break into pieces teleporting every hour into another sex, amusing no one except myself, living outside the boundaries, a rainbow misplaced. What is my homeland? Where can I live? A place of comfort, perhaps not this planet or the next. But I continue to search, to morph, until I am what I am to be. So that's Meta Gender Machine. The next one is also from um, Blackfire this time. And it's something that it's a one page poem. And then I have a one page list of all the research I did on it, you know, all the articles and everything, because a lot of my work is inspired by facts. So there's a lot of facts in here. It's called The New Americans. Before we were from Senegal, Gambia, the Gold Coast, Biafra, Angola, named for the land of our ancestors by the river, mountain, valley that we lived near, the work we did, the region we were from, Kolda, Wolof, Guru, Igbo, Malibo. Now, we are from Ohio, California, the East Coast, Maryland, Nevada. Named by our parents, renamed by ourselves to reclaim humanity, heritage, pride. For the pain survived to stand tall in a country fast to forget, slow to evolve. The first 20 were called Niga, much work to be done. The plan to create the ideal slave, break them young, wipe them clean of birth culture, transplant inferiority, fear, helplessness. All slaves are African. All Africans are slaves. Freedom was not colorblind, so they thought. 
our great great grandparents' names forbidden in the new world, slave names forced into their mouths. Part of the plan to control, to erase our legacy. But humans find a way using private names in their quarters to let their children know they still had some power, some breath that could not be stolen. We are called African American, arriving at that label in steps. Colored, Negro, Black, Afro-American, struggling to find equality, naming ourselves Jayla, Dion, Kamani, Iro, invoking God, strength, beauty, royalty. All Americans are humans. All humans are equal still struggling to hold these truths to be self-evident. Now, we are Americans of African descent, conceived on land soaked in the blood of greed, attacked by those still believing the original lie. We are born with the inherent need to be free to be respected, no matter what you name us or what we name ourselves, we are humans. We are Americans. So that's the new Americans. Thank you. So the next poem I'm going to read is a poem called Mami Wada, Goddess of Clear Blue. And Mami Wada is actually um, an African goddess that helped the sea, sea men on the sea find their way using the star maps. And um, that's kind of where the inspiration is came from. And then I just had to go somewhere else because that's just what I do. That's my job. <laughs> So this is called Mami Wada, Goddess of Clear Blue. It is republished in Troubled the Waters this year. Worry sings bright in your neurons. Your light's so blurred, I could barely taste you while I was sleeping, dreaming of the time before. I melted down two galaxies making my way here. Why you wait so long to call for me, baby? Your pain is clean and clear in the thickening tattoos on your back. You no longer hunger for us in your dreams. Silence has softened your soul, eaten at your aspect. You rest in my arms now. It's going to be all right. I used to visit the voodoo pantheons when you gyrated in dusty courtyards. Back when you came to us free and open in your sleep. Mama Vishnu and I introduced star maps to the faithful. Crowded your dreams with tomorrows full of luminancy brought your children to my lap, just like you now. Let them look through my eyes into the darkness to see nothing is empty. Lean their head against my belly so they could hear the purr of the never born. What took you from us is the hard things you build so you could forget the soft things. But hunger for a way to live without bruised, outstretched hands don't just go away because you fill the night with bright lights, making the moon and stars blush with neglect. 
You're always hungry for things to fill your hands and pockets. Shiny, unneeded things. I stayed with you because all that wanting, you made an opening for me. Couldn't resist your eyes rolled white upward and inward to me. You know how vain we can be. It's vanity hurting you now, baby. There's always a way to heal. You got to know where to look. What matters is the sharp edges behind your closed eyes. I savored the small wounds unhealed in your heart, even when my name lay dead in your mouth. So that's Mami Wada, Goddess of Clear Blue. The next one is called Mermaid in the Bronx. I live in Tucson now, but I used to live in the Bronx in New York. And I'm always writing, I'm always writing. It's just insane. And sometimes I just, you know, I'm just like in a living daydream all the time. So here we go. <laughs> Let's go, mermaid in the Bronx. <laughs> Walking along King's Bridge Road to the bus stop, she wondered at the shadowed life dragging behind. Even the roar of cars and buses couldn't hide the soft murmur of ocean waves calling. Her feet bled in shoes that never fit, even when he took her to the best shoemakers. Sitting on the express bus to Manhattan, she hungered to be surrounded by smooth, fresh water, even though the lungs she now used would disagree. Eyes closed, the motion of wheels against road reminded her of floating after a strong tail kick. If only she could remember the words the freer of this unreality. Designing clothes in an office on 36th Street, she drifted into smooth, swirling lines, soft, fin-like spikes, always wanting colors to be blue, green, pink, purple, touched with sparkles of light. Others laughed at her consistency, even when it always sold. Whispering to hidden memories of first waters that all humans carry inside. Leaving work early, she takes the subway to the tip of the island, sits in the park watching the river waves roll out to the ocean. She wants to dive in, go back to her first home. Will the memories return like dreams, her tail, her gills? Or will she drown as the doctors have warned her? Stepping to the iron fence, she stares into the gray water, wondering of the wet dreams, the man and his love. Even the pills cannot hide the wet green world shimmering in her sleep. Standing at the edge, eyes closed, how easy to let go, return to the quiet water. Home is where the heart is, her heart lost. She floats unanchored, tired of the words, the pills, hungry for the piece of water. When would she have the courage? 
to return home. So mermaid in the Bronx. <laughs> okay, I think I only have like two more left to share with you all. Uh, this one is called After the Fire, which was published in, I think this one, yes, in Essence Magazine and my collection of Light and Substantial. So it's called After the Fire. I lie in the ashes, desire, memories, hope, love, gone. Reduced to the same grayness except for the hint of shape, the sense of what was. How to rebuild from such fragile dust what brick can be formed with these emptied hands. I gather what the wind does not take, mix with tears, draw a capricious design on ground, willing to take my final offering. Standing on sooted bare feet, waiting for the cleansing of the next life. Dressed in ashes, I spread my arms. So that's after the fire. Thank you. One last poem, and it is, oh no, that's the other poem. Sorry, sorry. I thought I had these lined up, but you know how things go. Oh my gosh, I am so lost, it's not even funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, you know what? Kittens, that's it. That was the fifth poem. <laughs> okay, done and done. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank that you for, boy. yeah. Seducing us with words, thank you. Yeah, that voice, that's, I, that's sexy. <laughs> oh, well, you know, I've had good teachers, so they will be happy to hear that you all was feeling something. <laughs> yeah. I, I feel very lucky with Celie's powerful, just brilliant um, work. And then to have the seductress giving us poetry that brings us to other worlds where we, where, with mermaids. It, it, I think it can't get any better. But then I remember we still have Michael. So it can get even better. And because this is, I, I feel so lucky to be in front of such a great group of writers, just very lucky. Uh, poet Michael Wars book in, books include of poetry and protest from Emmett Till to Trayvon Martin, the Armageddon of funk, and we are all the black boy. His literary, Honors include a 2021 San Francisco Artist Grant, 2020 Berkeley Poetry Festival Lifetime Achievement Award, San Francisco Library Laureates, Gwendolyn Brooks Significant Illinois Poets, Poets Award, Creative Work Fund Award, NEA Fellowship, and an award from the Black Caucus of the American Library Association, which called his writing a poetic soundtrack to Black life. His poems are translated into Chinese by poet Chung Yu for their two language, one community workshop project. I'd like you all to give a very warm welcome to Michael War. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. And thank you for everyone being here tonight. Greatly appreciate it. And boy, those were two wonderful readings. Got some poetry and prose, and I'm gonna try to do the same. Um, I feel I need to let um, C. Lee and Linda know that you may not hear it in my voice because I moved to San Francisco when I was three with my family, but I'm also from the South. Um, my parents met in New Orleans and I was born in, Bat in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. I, I knew there was something good about you. I know, I don't get to say that very often. Um, and since my the, the promo for this event, the photo of me, you can see in the background, there's a poem or part of a poem. So I feel I need to share that entire poem. 
Um, so I'm going to begin with that. And it's one of my pandemic poems. And it was written um, for public installation, actually, at the Yerba Buena Center for the Arts, where it was just displayed um, um, in an installation for like three months. And it's called um, The City Speaks of This Moment. Uh, it's going to be published soon by Poetry Northwest. The city speaks of this moment. Tears roll down my streets and hills as they suffer from emptiness. Some life has disappeared, some life has returned. Coyotes feel safer in the suddenly borderless wilderness and roam through my urban forest. I watch the white crowned sparrows swell around now lifeless toll booths on a quieter golden gate. I hear them singing a new song. They hear each other sing above the din of silence traffic. Tenths of disowned people come and go, thousands invisible in plain sight. They don't care that the cable cars have deserted me, that coffee shops have turned their tables upside down, that mask wears are superheroes saving innocent lives, that 9-11 happens every day, that Black lives never matter. They do not want things back the way they used to be. They have never been sheltered in time or place. They crave a new world, a caring, centered, healing world, plagued by an infectious insanity. I see the signs on shuttered eateries predicting that we will survive. Realists calculate not all of us. I hear them shouting on their soapbox from overpriced rooftops that some of us is better than none of us. I know from agonizing experience that we are lost without dreamers. I have burned down before, down to the edges of Venice Avenue. Faults have shaken and broken my body. Bridges cracked, towers toppled, chasms opened, hearts stopped. I have survived and recovered from overwhelming loss. I have rebuilt, although not for everyone. This time, it could be different. This next poem is from the anthology uh, Black, Black Fire. See that? Get it. Um, this time, um, from the Black Fire this time, and this, um, it, this poem is titled The Armageddon of Funk. It's the, it's the title of um, my third book of poems published by Tia Chucha Press. And um, the, full title of the, the full title of this poem is The Armageddon of Funk, 1965 slash 2006 in memory of James Brown. 1955 being um, the year I was 10 years old and um, 2006 being the year that James Brown passed on, on Christmas day. Uh, the poem begins with a quote. The one thing that can solve most of our problems is dancing, the godfather of soul. Watts rebels, a tethered communist walks in space. T.S. Eliot, Nat King Cole, and Sir Winston Churchill die. Malcolm is murdered. The Grateful Dead is born. Sekou Sese Mobutu steals and sells the Congo. Che crosses Lake Tankiaka as Tatu to take it back. Ginsburg howls, speaking flower power in the city where I first imagined. The entire Northeastern United States blacks out. The Voting Rights Act is passed. US troops deploy to Dang Nang, Vietnam gang of four ascends. My only worry at 10 years old is what will happen to the world if James Brown dies. Monks rebel. Pluto is no longer a planet. The sun eclipses. Robert Creeley, Coretta Scott King, and the King of Tonga die. Monks are murdered in Miramar. The dead still play live. Congo holds its first true election since Lumumba's assassination. Howe turns 50. Jack Hirschman, communist, is poet laureate of the city where I first imagined. Deadliest heat waves since the Dust Bowl plagues Midwest. Voting rights are extended another inadequate quarter. 
Saddam Hussein hanged, forbidden city evicts Starbucks. So one of my poems in Blackfire this time is based on my experience as a foreign correspondent in Ethiopia. And much of my writing is rooted in actual incidents or real experiences, including um, experiences of my own. And this is an excerpt from one of those incidents that happened during the five years I lived and, re and reported from Addis Ababa. It's a prose piece titled, Even um, Angels Lie, and it hasn't um, been published, but I'm hoping it will become part of a larger work. Even Angels Lie, an excerpt. Sterling spotted Raul at the American Embassy on a night that would spice things up for the Cuban, who is who in a conspicuously failed attempt to be inconspicuous, wore cheap civilian clothes made in America and purchased in Addis Ababa's Mercado, the open air bazaar where you could buy anything from a goat to Coptic crosses that had buried and battered to acquire an air of antiquity. Raoul's hair was slicked back for the Marines' weekly Friday night party, where homesick Americans could indulge in hamburgers, Budweiser, and movies like The Shining and music like Staying Alive, while rubbing shoulders with embassy personnel and the pro-Americans of Addis Ababa. Raoul had been confined to the embassy for six months after his defection from the Cuban army. His fellow deserters had disappeared without a trace from the embassy three months earlier when they hopped the walls of the embassy on a Saturday night. It looked as if Raul was doomed to live among Marines and be tortured by disco music for the rest of his life. He responded by drinking whatever booze he could find. He was already so inebriated the night Sterling saw him that his speech was one long slur, spiced or spliced with shits, bullshits, and motherfuckers, knowledge and communication provided by the Black Marines. The Black Marines would at least talk to Raul. The White Marines worked hard at ignoring him, a difficult thing to do since he was the sole Cuban in a compound full of Americans. The Marines had been taught to destroy the communist enemy, and here they were sharing their precious beer and burgers with one that only six months earlier had fought on the side of a Soviet supplied army. First they want us to kill them, now they want, to, want us to sleep with them was the way that Terrence Jackson, a Marine from the Chicago South Side, summed up his frustration. One Marine, however, was way beyond frustration. Riley Murphy or Murph was obsessed with Raul. The only obstacle standing between him and Raul's neck was the State Department. That night at the party, Riley, who was bartending, refused to serve Raul another drink. The Cuban slurred the word motherfucker at the Marine and staggered out of the party. He retreated to his small quarters and drank from his own stash of Ethiopian tetch, a potent, sweet, golden honey wine. By the time he returned to the party, he was nearly incoherent, not recognizing or caring that it was still Riley behind the bar, he demanded another drink. Riley refused and said something that only Raul heard. He must have called him a gasano or a worm or the, the ultimate insult in a post-Castro Cuba, or said something about his mama. Because this time, without using a single profane word, the Cuban pulled out a switchblade and in one swift motion chopped the Marine's right ear off. It was an amazingly precise act of aggression for someone that seemed drunk to the point of blindness. Sterling stood motionless within striking distance of this drama. The aftermath of Raul's passion was imprinted in his mind like a Chagall painting, although not as pretty. The severed ear shared at the bar counter with planters peanuts, olives, napkins, maracino cherries, beer bottles, swizzle sticks, and other bar paraphernalia. Everyone who had been leaning against a small bar, bar was gone. So was Raul. There was a moment of silence as if in respect of Riley's ear. He hadn't screamed, being a Marine, he uttered a low intensity howl. 
The Ethiopian women who packed the party made up for this with screams that could have served as a soundtrack for a B-grade slasher film, releasing the emotion that Riley refused to exhibit. Raul had sprinted out of the party onto the embassy grounds before most of the regulars knew that their bartender's ear was lying on the counter. In the midst of the chaos, Marines trained for such mayhem were shouting unlikely military commands like, fuck that motherfucker, find that motherfucker, kill that motherfucker. <laughs> Someone, somehow, had the presence of mind to call an ambulance that ironically was from the Soviet-run hospital. Riley's parting words to the crowd assembled at the embassy great gates that watched in drunken disbelief as the Marine was loaded into the ambulance was, kill Raul. He screamed this with fanatical compassion combined with a lust for blood and would have killed Raul himself were he not bleeding so profusely. Immediately after Raul sped out of the party, the Marines had dashed to their barracks and returned literally dressed to kill. Whatever weaponry they had on hand was now strapped around their torsos. The charge de affairs, clad in robe, pajamas, and slippers, addressed them sedately in his best diplomatic tone. Calm down. Raul is a guest of the State Department. You are not to harm him. You are to find him and bring him to me. The Marines took off like wild, famished wolves searching for meat hidden on the embassy grounds. Searchlights were beamed, guns were cocked, knives were ready. To their disappointment, the Marines never had a chance for slaughter. They found Raul crouched down in an isolated corner of the embassy compound. He leapt up, gave them the finger, <laughs> cried, fuck America, and jumped over the embassy wall where he was promptly arrested by the Revolutionary Neighborhood Militia, which always kept a close watch on the American embassy. A few days later, after the incident, one of the Marines told Sterling that they had made a pact. Fuck the State Department. They were going to do Raul, blow him away for slashing off Wiley's ear. Sterling thought to himself, a Cuban life for an American ear. No one in Addis Ababa would have missed Raul. So that's a true story. <laughs> um, I was gonna end with an Ethiopian poem for my first book, but I am going to switch up and change my last poem uh, to Back to Baton Rouge from my book, The Armageddon of Funk. Where is that? This is my first book, The Armageddon of Funk, also from THU to Press. And um, I'm dedicating this to uh, Linda and Seeley, my, my Southern brethren, <laughs> my Southern people. I should say. This is, um, let me see, which one am I reading? I'm saying I'm going to read back to Baton Rouge. Okay. I have to read that directly from the book. Nope, that's not the right thing. Page 19. Okay. Wrong book. The book Soro is in my first book. This book is in my third book, um, The Armageddon of Funk. Okay, back to Baton Rouge. Okay. Last time I crushed this blackened soil, Roy Rogers was my hero. I squatted and painted rocks red with nail polish, the green ice from a Dixie cup dripping down my chin. My grandfather black as an eclipse, his Choctaw hair shining, his rusty carpenter hands twisting chicken necks at breakfast, my great aunt's farm smothered in shade and magnolias. My father's sky blue continental, its imperialistic grinning grill splattered with the state of Texas. My baby sister peeing beside the car. That was Louisiana. A jar of pickled pig lips reminds me where I come from, where gumbo ain't nouveau cuisine, and folks in every parish affectionately call me cuz, bridging the Baptist hova schism that blocked our childhood dance. I am product for returning to root, power book, power book in tow, out of place, embraced, my Frisco Chi Town artist twang mixing with their twang. 
They curl, yes, ma'am, to my West Coast mother. Our lips won't form the sound. The Louisiana in us too far gone. Uncle Alton, not seen since seven, asked, is poetry making money? They say this is a Creole thing. It doesn't matter. I envy my uncle's name. I covet all their names, names worthy of fat novels. My father, Alf C, my mother, Gay Nell, my Willie Mae and Bessie aunts, our roots so thick and gritsy, our names circumcised, our assimilation so invisible. Only the leaves and elwoods thrust between them cling to the Southern soil. I am of this land, yet lost, an immigrant in old country. Only the gumbo feels like home. Thank you. I, I just, beautiful. I, I um, Celie, Linda, <laughs> Michael, I just wanna thank you because you brought it with you. All three of you brought it in your, in your beautiful poetry. And what I liked about the poems that they really spoke about life. You know? Even the life of a mermaid counts, you know, <laughs> <laughs> it counts. But it's just the beauty of the words that were, it was so lovely to hear. And I, I'm, I have such admiration for all three of you. And I'm so grateful that you showed up and you brought your A game. That was just magnificent. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. So now we're going to uh, turn it over to Kathy. And Kathy, you tell us what, we, what, we, what we're going to do and, we, and we'll do it. Miss Kathy. Um, she's muted oh 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 okay oh, hold on i'm just trying to and there we oh, go while kathy is getting it um together can each of you let us know anything anything coming up that you want us to know reading because i i know there's a couple of readings coming up or um or just that something important as far as your work is concerned? I, I don't know if it worked, but I did put a document in the chat um, with some information. But one of the poems I didn't read tonight that's um, in Black Fire this time is a poem called What Not to Do, an unfinished poem, which is about the um, killings of Black boys and um, Black men. Uh -huh. And that poem appears in Black Fire this time. But also, it appears on the site of Obsidian Literature and Arts of the Africa in the African diaspora, and it's a digital page there that shows updates to the poem. And so, if you just Google Michael War Obsidian Lit, it'll it, it'll come up, or you could go to the Obsidian um, website. Th thank you, thank you very much, Michael. Uh, Linda, is there something you'd like us to know about? Um, whoa, well, you know, had a lot of stuff come out last year. <laughs> um, I don't, I, I just put my site in there because um, last year will never happen again. I had 27 anthologies and magazines I was in. I don't know how that happened. <laughs> no, that's not going to happen. Again. So, <laughs> you know, including Predator. Come on now, really? <laughs> Woo. Mm. Well, and we can just go to your site and 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 look at them. Congratulations! And by the way, that will happen again. Yes, that I will happen. That's, It'll be more. Yes, It'll be different. It'll be different. <laughs> it, it will be more. Um, Celie, what's going on with you? So, like I said, the first poem that I read, I didn't get the title. It's titled uh, "What Good Are Poems," and so that is in this wonderful anthology, uh, along with another poem that I wrote, Us From Dirt, which is a celebration of African-American farmers. Uh, I grew up around lots and lots of Black farmers, and I think that we don't do enough to celebrate Black farmers. Also, to coincide with Brother War, I have a, that, that second poem I read, uh, Tree of Life, Black Colleges Be Here, will be in the Obsidian uh, special HBCU edition. So they did a 
uh, edition of journal celebrating HBCU. So that poem, um, Tree of Life. And then I have, a, I have another work, and I don't remember that work, and, and I think Dr. McMillan is also a part of that work. There's going to be a, a special issue of Tribes that's coming out that's being edited by Ishmael Reed. And so I have a uh, poem in that journal uh, of tribes coming out. And then other than that, I'm just, unlike y'all, just happy being a trifling writer when my wife is not looking. So that's how I spend my life. Uh, when she's looking, I'm doing something productive. And when she's not looking, I'm being a trifling writer. So thank y'all for having me here. And I, I'm always happy to be in the presence of so many great writers. Thank wow. you. By the way, the tribes, it's tribes number 16. Um, the Black Lives Matter edition, it's already out. It came out a, a little bit ago and, and it is quite beautiful. It's, I believe the cost of it is $40, but you can see it online. And, and, and um, uh, congratulations for being, a, it's an incredible piece of work, incredible piece of work. Um, so now we'll turn it over to you, Kathy. All right, well, thank you all. Um, that was an amazing, amazing reading. I feel like, whoa, wow, we got to be here for this. And I want to just let everybody unmute for a minute and give your love and your appreciation to Linda, Michael, and Celie. So go ahead and unmute. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. Oh, excellent, excellent. We got deep, we got sexy, we got educational. <laughs> we got like, wow. That was excellent. Excellent. Was excellent. Don't forget y'all wow. fertilizer. I would I would That's also like to get fertilizer. emails from people because I didn't get to, to talk on the chat somehow. It didn't open for me. So I'd, I'd like to make sure I have everybody's email exactly. So if I want to buy a book, I can get in touch with you directly. I only have, I think I only got, what did I get? Tribes, what else? Um, that's about it. Um, if you want to tell them where they, you can purchase where you prefer purchasing because you can get their work on Amazon, but there are other locations if you want to go, not go to Amazon. Yeah, if there's other locations, that'd be great. Yeah, yeah uh, you can, like I said, you can go to my website, uh, psychedelicliterature.com. Uh, and so if you just go to my website, psychedelicliterature.com, it'll have the link to all, where all my books are. Uh, and and yeah, so that's, that's the easiest way. And you also, if you get to psychedelicliterature.com, you can also email me, so. Uh, I love to hear get emails from folks and stay in touch with y'all. So yeah, that'd be great, Michael. What was yours? Um, I'm putting it in the chat. Oh, okay. I hope I can find it. My yeah. chat isn't opening up at all. Okay. Um, I don't know well, what's going on. Where you can it. find everything I do is at Michael War one word lowercase um, dash creative work dot tumblr dot com. But there's a whole bunch of different, I have a whole bunch of different sites. That's why I'm putting it in the, in the chat. And there's already a page that I sent earlier that has most of it. Oh, great. Okay, thank you. And I'm at lindaaddisonwriter.com. Linda Addison Writer all together. Because there's another Linda Addison out there that's got a lot of stuff going on. She don't look nothing like this. She's a lawyer, I'm just saying. Okay, <laughs> thank you, Linda. You will know if you got the wrong one. Immediately. <laughs> Excuse me, what is your name? I'm going to actually send it personally, but Michael wrote to you and see if that, if see if you get it then. Uh, uh, Are you talking to me? Yes. Yeah. What, what Nanette you, Dietz. What would you say? Nanette Dietz. Okay. Let me put in Nanette. Okay. And, and, and let us know. Oh, here, oh, here, Nanette. Okay. Yeah. Let me Same know. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm hoping you'll so get it. You so trying to help me find a place to live. Oh, oh well, I hope you got it. On Facebook. Okay. Okay. And let us know if you didn't get it, okay? Because I, I, I'll find another way to get it to you. Oh, great. Thank you. Thanks so much, Kim. 
Oh, wait. And wait, I want to say something else about C. Dawn. She is speaking her book into existence. So we see you getting that book and, and into existence. We see you having what you need to make it happen. Thank you. I just figured, let me put it. And then you guys can also, all these fantastic people on the line, send me upcoming events and stuff so I can um, support and be a part, you know, of, of hearing all the amazing work too. So that's why I put it in there, but thank you. Oh, great. Beautiful. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you to everybody. And uh, usually what we do is we have about 15 minutes to do some writing and then you get to share it, everybody that wants to. And you, I'm, I mean, everything you wrote was a prompt. So I'm hoping people took down word